several things could be happening. One could be they're not really committed to obeying the word and there's just sin. It's just happening and it's killing the work of the spirit. The other thing is you're not asking for God's presence. Where you ask for it, he shows up. And sometimes the first steps are that he starts to clean you up a little bit so that he'll enjoy being there in your presence. You want the spirit to be in the middle of whatever whatever gathering it is. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me again. You know, our our call on our life as followers of Jesus is to build the kingdom. That's that's what we're after. We want to expand and build the kingdom. But there's a whole lot of different ideas about how we're supposed to do that. And, you know, if you you look around, the churches that get the most notoriety, you know, I I heard a pastor say years ago, in America we spell God B-I-G, you know, so everything is, is big and we determine the success of a ministry or an outreach outreach based on just expanse of it and budget and if you're if you're social media how many likes how many subscribers what who's following if you're a local church how many people are showing up and where's the budget and that kind of thing is that is that really God's emphasis is that what he wants us focused on uh, in this episode here. I, I want to talk some uh, about some of these things because I'm, I'm leading you into a study in the pastoral letters where Paul is talking to Titus and Timothy, and these are young disciples that he now has a trusted relationship with, and he can launch them out to establish and grow the people in this new venture of the church, the people of God. And he is going to be emphasizing certain things to them. And I just want, uh, I've got some foundational thoughts. And uh, again, I, I, it's practical for us now, because uh, even, even today, as we're recording this, it seems like every week there's some minister or ministry that we hear uh, that has fallen into sin, or there's a scandal, or there's something being found out. And you can feel the purging that God is doing right now, that judgment has begun in the house of the Lord, and we are the house. We are his temple, so he is at work, and we're in a season of, of purging um, I, what I would call a controlled burn. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody do that. A bunch of men get together, and they burn fields. It used to happen more uh, in in some of the outlying areas, farm country. You you burn off everything, but it's controlled. There, you're around the edges. You're controlling it, and you you're trying to burn things off in a particular plot of land, and that's the field that I have right now for the body of Christ. There's a controlled burn, and the burn. If you've ever been driving down the expressway and there was some kind of a car on fire and it fell into the grass and it burns out a large area in in a very short time. Where the burn happened, it's extremely green grass that starts to blow to to grow up in there. It gets rid of the things that are in the way of new growth. So that controlled burn promotes more growth, fresh growth. That's the season that we're in. there's There's a lot that's being stripped away so that we can get back to what has God actually called us to do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emphasize some of this for us tonight and uh, just work our way through. We're building a foundation because we're talking about uh, the mentor Paul giving letters to Titus and Timothy, his ment- mentees, his disciples, to expand the kingdom of God and grow this thing. Where I want to start is this phrase, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, I, I say this to you all the time. This is the mandate project.com. And in it, we're, the basis of the mandate is Genesis 128. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and take dominion over birds, fish, and all the other animals. We are, we are created in God's image, and that's Genesis 126. And as because we're created in his image, we are God's imagers. Dr. Michael Heiser uses that phrase. We are his imagers. We have been placed here, and he is sharing with us his life and his rule. So we are to live as he would live and rule as he would rule. And that's what's in this idea of the mandate, 
Be fruitful and multiply. That's God's lifestyle. Fill the earth and subdue it. That's his authority in his rule. Uh, there is, we are to fill the earth with the purposes of God, and then we are to subdue that which resists him and which stands in the way of that, of that expansion. And that has never changed. When you get to the end of the Gospels, Jesus is saying, go, go out, go forth, do this, expand, don't settle down here. That was the great sin that was happening at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. They refused going out. They decided, we're going to rule ourselves. We don't need you. And they were creating something to their gods to commune with their gods. And they were, they were trying to rule God out. And he scattered them. And often, uh, part of the judgment of God is when the people of God refuse to go, he scatters them and pushes them out into, into new areas. So, be fruitful and multiply. That's the goal. Even today, in the American church, don't lose sight. The, the primary focus is the work of God in your heart that you are to come into a healthy, intimate relationship with your Heavenly Father. And then as you are figuring some things out and you're getting cleaner and healthier on the inside, you are to re- reproduce yourself. You are to find others that you can you can share with them the things that you've discovered and lead them into that healthy life. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, listen to this. Paul, again, writing to Timothy, uh, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And there's the progression, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. You, the things that you've learned pass that on to others that they may teach others also. It's this progression. It is life touching life, heart touching heart. It isn't just funneling people into meetings. These things can happen in meetings and getting together for for large corporate meetings. It's it's a part of the the life of the church and gathering and uh, it's kind of like regular family reunions, you know. Um, Even the the collective corporate worship, there is just something that's powerful to enjoy the presence of God. That's, that's what we want. But don't lose sight of the individuals. If you attend a local church and you're in, in church on a Sunday or a Saturday, whichever it may be, and don't lose sight of the individuals that are in that room with you. Don't just look at yourself, what can I get out of this? Look around to see who can you add value to? Who can you check on? I wonder how he's doing. I wonder how they're doing. I wonder how she is. Be mindful of the individual lives that make up this corporate thing that you meet with every week, Every week, this, this community. Don't lose sight of the individuals. And when it comes to the American church, the goal is not for us to be watchers and consumers. We aren't just to be there to observe and to consume the goods. The coffee, the donuts, the music, the, we're not just there to take in. We're there to be built up. And we, if you're a part of the body of Christ, you're a part of that building a process, looking at others and seeing what you can add. How can I help them be built up and, and move forward? If you're not engaged in the process of being fruitful and multiplying, do you know why? I, I just I just want to give you that question to chew on a little bit. If you're not engaged in the process of really pursuing a fruitful life, if you're just ho-humming it every, every week, you say you're a follower of Jesus, but you're really not engaged with the process. I'm not trying to bring condemnation to you. I'm provoking you to growth. I want you to think about what you're not thinking about. Why am I not involved with this? Hey, do I do I have some kind of contact with other people talking about the Word of God, what I'm finding? Have I gotten so lazy that I'm so disconnected from it? Man, it's been forever since I read my Bible. I, I want to provoke you toward that. That's what produces a fruitful life. And when you start to live that fruitful life, then it's time to begin to think about, about multiplying and, and reproducing yourself. So do you know why you're not engaged? 
maybe some of you do and you've been putting some things off. I just want to be a voice for, let's get going. Let, let's do this. Let's find some other people that you can engage with and, and kickstart whatever's happening in your soul. But I have another question for you. Are you even born again? You know, sometimes we go to church and we just figure because we're here and somebody said, well, you need to be baptized. And well, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm mindful. I, I believe in God. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through the motions. I'm going to do what I'm being asked to do around here. This is how we do it, which isn't all bad, but it becomes bad if you're doing that and thinking that the good works that you do are going to save you and bring you into right relationship with God. You need a born again experience. And so uh, all I'm going to tell you is call in the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Now, if you are in a, a fellowship, find somebody. Find find someone. If you're a young lady, find an older woman that you know knows God. If you're a young man, find an older man, someone that you respect in your community that you know is a godly person and you can get some answers to questions. You may be shocked that they're they're more than willing to meet with you and begin working on that question. Boy, am I am I born again? And again, some of you, it's possible that you are born again and you're nervous because you don't think God accepts you. Well, that's that's another issue. You are born again, but you're very weak in your faith. You need to be built up. I'm I don't want to create unnecessary fear and nervousness about your salvation and have you doubt it. But I, what I want you to do is to make sure. You need to have an encounter with the Spirit of God where he makes sure that you know, yes, I am. I, the, the question is settled, and now I need to move forward in my growth process. The next thing I want to talk to you about, and this really is kind of the, you know, the, the crux of, of being, of, of following Jesus, is seeing yourself as a disciple. Um, Jesus gave us that example when he chose 12. I wanted to read you Mark 3, verses 13 to 15. Listen to this. Jesus went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. Now, that's, a, that's just an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting phrase. He called to him those he himself wanted. You know, who do you want in your life? If you're, a, if you're a, an authority in the body of Christ, who do you want in your life? Give them a call. Tell them you want to spend time with them. And they came to him. So he called those he wanted. They came to him. Now, it was a large number. So Jesus had more than 12 disciples. He had a throng of people that considered themselves his disciple. They wanted to be just like him. They followed him wherever he was. If he's going to be doing any teaching, they're, they're coming after him. And it says in verse 14, Mark 3, Then Jesus appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. I, I love that verse. He appointed 12. So he, out of the, the many, and in another passage, he spent the night in prayer, and his father directed him whom he should choose. He appoints 12. What's the purpose? That they might be with him. See, that's where the fruitful life comes from. The fruitful life comes from spending time with Jesus. How do you do that? Well, first and foremost, you learn how to, how to read and absorb his word. Secondly, you begin to develop a prayer life, and that takes time. And you've got to be around some other people that know how to pray. pray. You need to find a community where you can learn how to do these things. You've got to find out what it means to be filled with the Spirit, because you can't do this in your flesh. Your natural man cannot just follow Jesus. You need the work and the help of the Holy Spirit, who is within those who are born again. And then that community. You know, you want to be in a community of people. And see, I'm using this word community. Maybe that's kind of new for some of you. If I say church, your head will go to that American-shaped institution that meets in a building. I don't want you to think like that. Sometimes you can meet with two people at Starbucks. You can meet with a handful of people maybe on a regular basis, in somebody's family room, on their patio. 
So it, it's just meeting with a particular group of people that you're building a relationship with. They're all followers of Jesus. That is a community. And where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in their midst. So you want to enjoy his presence. What happens is he empowers your gifting. So then you're all there, and whatever your particular perception, perspective of things uh, uh, happens to be, that comes together uh, when you're all together, and it builds you up. You start to see things, understand stuff. There's just something that happens. It's a synergy. It's a power that is very difficult to put words on, but when you experience it, it draws you back. The Spirit is at work in the middle of that. If you're in a particular fellowship and you don't experience that, you need to figure that out. Usually that means you're gathering with a bunch of people that uh, several things could be happening. One could be they're not really committed to obeying the word and there's just sin. I mean, it's just happening and it's killing the work of the spirit. The other thing is you're not asking for God's presence. Where you ask for it, he shows up. And sometimes the first steps are that he starts to clean you up a little bit so that he'll enjoy being there in your presence. But you want the Spirit to be in the middle of whatever whatever gathering it is. If you're going to have a bunch of friends that are followers of Jesus over your house bef- beforehand, pray, Lord, please meet with us. We want to experience your power and presence, and we invite you into this place to, to minister to us. And just that simple language, we've seen that change the atmosphere of a meeting of people. Those are the kinds of things you want to have. Um, so uh, let me see. I, I have a sentence here that this is interesting. Have surrendered your will to the Lordship? Have you? Okay. <clears throat> a little typo to myself. Have you surrendered your will to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? So so you've got followers that are coming after Jesus, and there's a lot of them, and out of them he picks 12. Where these are people that have surrendered at some level, they've surrendered to his authority, his Lordship, and they are pursuing him. Have you ever had that moment? Have you ever had a moment where you told God, I surrender my will to you? And it's not a bad thing. Some of you are going, well, you know what? I'm, I know tomorrow's going to be a bad, bad day. That's fine. Every day you just begin to talk to him. I want to feel safe in surrendering to you. Maybe some of you had a real harsh male authority figure when you were a young person, and it's very hard for you to think about surrendering to God. That's where you need the older veteran who's been walking with God that can help you walk through those issues to get that eventually cleared out so that your your intimacy with God increases. Is there stuff in our soul that it's going to take time before it's purged out? It's not going to be a quick overnight thing. Somebody, you know, sometimes somebody gets hands laid on them and and everything clears up, but for most people, it's not that quick. It's a process. There is layer after layer after layer of mindsets and experiences and memories that have been all laid down in our subconscious, and it's down there in the bottom wreaking havoc in our life up front. I call it the malware of the soul. All that stuff is running in the background. We can't figure out what's happening. That's why we need the older ones in the body to lead us into this level of freedom. All right, then let's talk about um, making disciples of all nations. So you can see in Genesis, we're told, be fruitful, multiply. So multiplication is the key. So you think, well, you know, Billy Graham, he multiplied himself because he had thousands that came. Did he? I mean, I'm not, I'm not criticizing large meetings. I'm just saying in America, remember, we like to spell ministry B-I-G. So if we get a, a large gathering, we think that's successful. Is it? You know, in a large group, it's very easy to walk in, walk out, not get noticed, not deal with anything that's in your soul, and go back to your normal orbit, whatever your routine is, and just walk away from God and not really have it affect you. But if you have somebody in the body of Christ that walks up to you and says, hey, wasn't that, wasn't that good teaching? What did you think about it? That changes everything, because now it's life touching life. Now... I'm forced to think about and respond. That's just, that's just a healthy way to begin to grow. 
to begin to, to walk and talk things out. So now we come to this issue of make disciples of all nations. We've been told, be fruitful and multiply in Genesis. Jesus gives us an example of choosing 12 of all the people. He, he chooses and focuses his time on 12. He is going to reproduce himself in these 12. They don't know what the future holds. You and I, as we read the Gospels, we know what's coming, the book of Acts. They don't know that that's coming. They have spent three and a half years with Jesus, and he has put into them some of these key thoughts about what it takes to build the kingdom. But they're not going to understand it until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fills them and they begin to remember all of these lessons that they received. That's the life of a, of a disciple. When you're discipling, you're giving information, and you're hoping that it that these seeds take root. You never know when it's going to catch. Just like I never realized what was happening all those years when uh, in my 20s and 30s when people are making inroads and they're giving me advice. And it, it took a long time before I finally got it and before I started to connect some of those dots. So when you're discipling, you're feeding, you're obeying, you're, you're doing what God has put on your heart to give to these people that are looking to you for leadership. But eventually, those seeds will take root. They'll, they'll grab. Now, this whole idea, how does the kingdom get built? One life at a time. It's not big stuff. It's one person at a time. It's Jesus noticing that some woman just grabbed his prayer shawl. And he stops and says, who touched me? He felt the power of God go out from him. He stopped. He had a throng around him. She fought her way through and grabbed that prayer shawl. That's, he, he noticed this is how we build the kingdom. We're noticing individual people. We're not just looking at crowds. Our eyes are on those who may need something that I've experienced or that I know, or that I can just pray for them. Um, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus, in the book of Matthew, this are, these are his last words uh, to the disciples. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me. Now, that's, that is a huge statement. Uh, the other day, this occurred to me. I'm just going to put this in here. I don't want to skip over it. In America, we think authority is earned. We think if I get more education, I'll get more authority. If I make more money, I'll have authority. I don't, someone doesn't have the authority, doesn't, hasn't earned my attention. I, I think they have authoritative voice. If they have a great following, if they have a lot of materials out there, there's all kinds of reasons why authority is is earned. It's it's a base of a, it's, the basis is a meritorious process here. You have to earn authority in the kingdom of God. It's given. It is a given. When we are in Christ, it's given to us. You need to understand that you don't earn the authority of Jesus. If you're born again and in Christ, He has given you authority. And you need to, by faith, receive it and learn how to use it, not only for your good, but for the good of others. So I just I want you to be thinking, you don't have to earn this. You walk into a situation that requires the power of God, you've been given authority. You can ask God, what, what would you like me to do here? Because I know I have authority. You need to get used to that. You know, Put that code on. You've been given authority, by faith, receive it. And ask God how he wants to work that out in your own life. All right, so Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, as you are. Now, you know the verse, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. But what I want to show you is the word go is a participle, it's continuing action. So this is how, this would be a better way to read that. As you are going, therefore, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So you've got three participles here. As you're going, baptizing, and teaching. Ongoing. But the verb, the key in this passage is 
make disciples. So Jesus is saying, as you are going, this isn't like commissioning missionaries. This is telling them, as you're going through life, be on the lookout for people who are willing to follow me. Make disciples. Well, how am I going to make a disciple? I'm going to say, I'm following Jesus. Do you want to follow him with me? If you say yes, I'm going to baptize you and I'm going to teach you. That's that's going to be our process. One life at a time. And then he lets them know, I'm always going to be with you. So don't worry. This may lead you into some pretty creepy stuff, uh, some tense times. I'm always going to be with you. You won't be alone. I'm going to walk this out with you. One life at a time. That's my emphasis to you. I want you to see that one life at a time. I have referred to this in the past, but I've been working my way through a book called Deep Mentoring. And in it, they make this statement, mentoring is a slow and deep work. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. I've had relationships where I was on the receiving end of being discipled. And it was years. And and I look back at some of the things these guys taught me, and it just took a long time before I put it all together. And then I've had relationships where I was uh, the discipler, <clears throat> giving information. And sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll make a suggestion or I can see I need, I need to come from this angle for a little bit. And it, I may have to hit it eight, nine, ten times before it finally clicked. That's the way it works. It is a slow, deep work. And it, you're going to have to have patience when you start to give yourself to somebody else. This isn't quick quick and easy work. This is slow and dealing with the layers of the past and mindsets that that person picked up that the Spirit of God, the Word of God is going to have to cut through. It's going to take a long time. Jesus gave himself and just slowly walked through that process with him. I, You know, I want to, I want to show you something that uh, hit me as I was reading through this deep mentoring book, and I started to think about Paul's Paul's relationships, key relationships. Um, and I discovered a lot of information on it, and it was kind of a new new thing for me. As I started to think about Paul instructing, spending time with Timothy and Titus, um, and, and Paul is the disciple, I started thinking, well, who discipled him? Because, yeah, he'd been a, a Pharisee, but early in the book of Acts, there is there are people who are commissioned to go out and stone believers. What they were called was followers of the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So they were after those people of the way who are the followers of Jesus. And the day that Stephen in Acts 7 was stoned, those that stoned him threw their cloaks at the feet of Saul, who later became Paul. So Paul was a Pharisee, and he says, I think in the book of Colossians, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, that Colossians are Philippians. Well, it, it takes a while, even though he had a tremendous conversion experience in Acts chapter 9, where he sees a flash of light, he hears the voice of God, but he had to grow up into the revelation that he was receiving about who Jesus was. <laughs> So real quick, I'm just going to hit quickly on these. His mentor was Barnabas. So there was a time after Paul's conversion, he goes to join the church at Jerusalem, and they don't want any part of him. I mean, they're nervous because this is the guy that heads up the stoning. And Barnabas came alongside and began to bring him under his wing and stood up for him and convinced the leaders of the church, no, he's all right. He's, he's a good guy. He's one of us. So Barnabas, and Barnabas was a Levite, so he, he took Paul, uh, pulled him in, and Barnabas was steeped in the Old Testament law of the Mosaic way, so he would have an immediate connection with Paul, but he would give him the things of the Spirit and bring him into a deeper understanding of who Jesus was. So that was that, was that relationship, that original mentor, and I'm sure there were others, but Barnabas, he began to travel with them. The problem was they hit a fork in the road because Barnabas brought along either his cousin or his nephew, John Mark, and they were in a tough position planting churches, and John Mark quit on him and left. And when 
uh, Saul, Paul, was going to go out on his next missionary journey. He rejects him. They argue, and you don't hear about Barnabas anymore. But the guy who shows up is Silas, and it appears that Silas was a co-worker. He was a peer. He wasn't somebody. Uh, now Paul is growing up into his faith. He's growing in his ability to lead, and he now is looking for co-workers to join him. Then as time goes on, you see in several places it mentions Silas and Timothy in the same sentence, several places. <clears throat> so uh, Paul takes on Timothy, and then he and Silas begin to spend a lot of time with Timothy, and, and the same with Titus. So you go from Barnabas the mentor to Silas the co-worker, the peer, to Timothy and Titus and a number of others, but we know more about Timothy and Titus where he is discipling them. So I just wanted to point that out to you, that Paul was a was a, a model to us of how to have these key relationships. Now, <clears throat> let's say you, you don't, you never have had these mentoring relationships, but you're interested and you're saying, Dave, where do I start? Well, let me give you just a couple of pointers here. First of all, let's say you want to be a mentor. You've, you've been... Uh, you've been in the body of Christ, you, you've been in Bible studies, you're learning, you're growing, your faith is increasing, and there's a lot of stability in you. First of all, I'd say look for someone that's living a life that, um, okay, wait a minute, I used the wrong language here. I'm talking about somebody who wants a mentor. <clears throat> you've never had one, you've never had somebody disciple you. So you're saying, where do I start with that? Okay, look for someone that's living a life that you'd want to live. So again, if you're in some type of fellowship, or, you know, for me, when God touched my life, I happened to have, and it was funny, I had a spirit-filled Presbyterian elder sitting behind me at work. I was in my oh mid-20s, I think I was 24, and this guy was in his mid-30s, 10 years older than me, and I, I show up at work and I say, man, you're not going to believe what happened to me. I tell him, he goes, hey, let's get coffee. And that started our relationship. He started feeding me books. He started telling me things and making suggestions. It, it was just a, it was such a God arrangement for that to happen. If you don't have that, look for that. Look for a guy in your fellowship a little bit older that you look at him as stable and he's got this relationship with God. Pursue him. Don't rush into a commitment though. You're just trying to get to know him. You want to slowly work into, like all of a sudden you realize, oh, wow, I, I think this is going somewhere. He's got an interest in me. I got an interest in him. Don't rush into, I go out, I have coffee with him the first time, and then I say, hey, would you be my mentor? Don't do that. Just enjoy the relationship and see what develops. And pray for the Lord to make the connection. That's what you're, you want God to make these arrangements. Be flexible and patient. Let God arrange things. Don't hurry it. Uh, maybe it's going to take you a while. Maybe you're in, in a position where you're, I don't even see these kind of guys. Okay, this is going to take, you're asking God to make this arrangement. Be flexible, be patient, wait for him to do this. And then lastly, some mentoring relationships can last a long time. So you don't want to hurry this. You don't, you don't want to throw a wrench in it. But once those relationships are established, I've been in some of them that last years and they're just good. They're rich. So let God put that thing that thing together. All right. <clears throat> now, let's say you're thinking, you know what? I never thought of myself as a mentor, but I do know some guys that need some help. What do I do? I I want you to hear this this phrase, pay attention. Pay attention to the people around you. If you're a woman, pay attention to those young girls, young ladies, single or married. You all of a sudden somebody catches your eye. You're a guy, you've been walking with God, you've figured some things out in your marriage and parenting, and you see some people that you're thinking, okay, I need to get to know him. Have, have lunch, have breakfast. Just poke around and see where they are and see if they'd be interested in that. Um, another phrase that I came across, notice the unnoticed. You know, there's people in church circles, they're quiet, they're timid. Maybe they had a rough childhood. They, they really lack self-esteem. There's just, there's just, they don't have the wherewithal to ask someone for help. Pay attention. Watch for that. This may be a diamond in the rough. You're trying to pull some things out of some people. And through the years, 
I've seen that met with people and develop some relationships with guys that never would have stepped up and asked for help. But just showing an interest, an occasional cup of coffee or breakfast, and you start to build a relationship that at least they know you're interested and you're available if they run into some things. In the meantime, you're praying for them. You can add them to your prayer list. You're praying for guys because we want men who are strong and are pursuing God, getting comfortable with what God is offering to them, spiritual weapons, spiritual tools, grace, forgiveness, mercy. You, we, we've got to bring each other along so that we're strong. Why do we want to be strong? So that if God pours out his spirit, we got somebody to lead it and, and um, keep that thing going. We want to sustain it. Uh, pray for God to connect you. Go slow. Allow the spirit to speak. Just, you're, you're looking for... I, I've, I've had a lot of surface relationships, just kind of checking on people. How you doing? Let me know if you need something. And sometimes you never hear from them again, which that's fine. But, but you throw out enough seed, something's going to grab and take off in growth. And that's, that's what you're looking for. You want, you want something that, um, that God has arranged. That's what you're after. All right, let me give you some final thoughts. Are you engaged in, a, in living a fruitful life? Are you born again? I want you to think that through. If you've got that settled, awesome. Secondly, take notice of the quality of your life. You know, sometimes you get caught up trying to help somebody else and you're ignoring what's going on inside of you. Don't do that. You will become a better discipler when you learn how to deal with your stuff. And uh, be gentle and patient with yourself in seeking to overcome some of those sticking points in your soul. Are you at a stage of life that you should be paying attention to the spiritual growth of someone younger? Is it time to notice the unnoticed? I want you, and for some of you, if that's a very foreign thought. Maybe this is something you just need to pray into it. Wow, Lord, am, am I ready? Because some of you don't see yourself as, as being a discipler. <laughs> You're thinking, well, I don't know the whole Bible. You don't need to know the whole Bible. All you need to, you know, when you, I was just having a conversation with a guy who's my agent, and I said, you know what, isn't it interesting? After a few years, you just realize, I know some stuff. And if you, you've been a, 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 even a casual pursuer of God, when, when you make yourself available for, for the growth of another guy, or if you're a woman, the growth of a younger woman, your growth will accelerate. Because there's this engagement that the Spirit starts to equip you with what you need to help them move forward. And lastly, this, the, the emphasis of this session is to tell you the kingdom of God grows one life at a time. One life at a time. Not big, just taking our time and drilling down, spending time and letting the Spirit of God go deeply into the heart of another person. And that happens by just giving ourselves and making ourselves available. That's how we're going to grow leaders. We give ourselves one person at a time. So Lord, I ask that you work in these people's lives, that you will, that you will put a hunger both uh, in the hearts of those listening, that they would want to further their own growth and then share the things that they've discovered with other people. That's discipling. Move in their hearts. Strengthen us, Lord. Draw us to you and cleanse us. Fill us with your spirit. Open up your word and develop oak trees, Lord. Develop oak trees whose roots are deep and we can take the winds of adversity in life and show other people what we've learned. I thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.